My name is Phil, I'm K9HI. I am um, the Eastern Mass Assistant Section Manager. And with me tonight are Dan Brown, W1DAN, who is our Technical Coordinator for Eastern Mass, and Ed Hare, W1RFI, ARRL Lab Manager. But uh, I got your title right, Ed. Yes, you did. Lab Manager. That's the Super. lab behind me, so. Okay. Well, we're here this evening uh, to hear a presentation from Dan on the new RF exposure rules. And I would like to uh, briefly introduce Dan. Dan was born and raised in New Orleans, caught the shortwave bug in the early 1970s, and he's, he discovered listening to shortwave broadcast stations, but soon found the BFO switch on his Helicrafters S120. Dan discovered hams not only discussing the latest football game and weather, but also home brewing, home brewing tube amplifiers and modifying rigs. Dan's always been a tinkerer. He's built a couple of accessories, obtained his license in 1978, and got on the air on CW with a Heath Apache and a Helicrafters SX-101A, and he modified them, of course. Since that time, Dan has enjoyed not only vintage gear and the AM mode, but modern software-defined radios with DSP, Class E RF amplification, as well as digital modes such as PSK-31. While he does not claim to know everything about radio, Dan is happy to assist fellow hams with technical questions, promote, promote STEM education, and citizen science. W1DAN is also the president of the Wellesley Amateur Radio Society for many years, I might add. He works as a broadcast engineer in Boston, and he lives in Natick, Massachusetts. Take it away, Dan. Phil, thank you very much. And we also have Ed here, W1RFI, with us, uh, who's going to answer uh, questions that you may have that you can type in. Uh, to us. So thank you for joining us. Really great to have you. It's a very interesting topic. All right, so RF exposure. We're going to look at three things tonight. Uh, first one are the RF exposure rules that the FCC came out and review the guidelines. We're going to look at exposure analysis, and then we're going to go through uh, three examples. So um, yesterday, uh, May 3rd, a new uh, FCC report and order just came into effect and uh, just gave us a little bit of an analysis change. Um, from 1998 on, uh, most stations were compliant. If you did your check, uh, that check is still good. So if you evaluated before May 3rd, you're good. However, if your station power was increased or your antenna was changed, you just have to redo. And there are easy online calculators to do that, so you don't have to get really deep into math or anything like that. So that's the gist of the whole thing. Let's get a little bit more into it. Let's introduce Ed Hare, W1RFI, sitting next to me. Uh, he wrote the book RFI Exposure in You in 1998, which is still an excellent book. He's a ARRL lab supervisor. And he's the IEEE EMC Society Vice President for Standards. I got a lot of information from Greg Lappin, N9GL. He's the chair of the ARRL Safety Committee. Uh, he does a lot with the IEEE. He's on the FCC Tech Advisory Council, and he does consulting as well. And as Phil noted, uh, I'm in Natick, Massachusetts. I'm the technical coordinator, coordinator for this area. And I'm the president of the Wellesley Amateur Radio Society. And believe it or not, I'm still learning about RF. So RF exposure is effectively tissue heating due to the exposure of high levels of RF in the area. Uh, it warms up the tissue of the body, and the body may not be able to dissipate the heat. And RF can do damage to us if it's too high and too long. Guidelines were first started in 1985 by the National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements and the IEEE. And in 1998, the FCC uh, put out the first exposure rules. In 2019, they revised the rules, but it took a while until yesterday before things to become active. This new report and order is 19-126. And it defines the rules for RF exposure across all industries that use radio frequency signals. Uh, the past exposure standards are maintained. Uh, there are no changes in that. 
And we can reference OET Bulletin 65 and 65B if we want to learn more about exposure compliance and how HAMS can do testing. And of course, we always need to be cognizant of our FCC rules. So, what the FCC wants us to do is simply limit human exposure to RF. Uh, we do it in two ways. We stay below two thresholds. One is for radio hams or occupational, uh, which is the controlled threshold, which has a higher uh, signal strength, but a shorter period of time. And then there are people walking by or your neighbors, the general population or uncontrolled, they have a lower threshold uh, and a longer period of time. This has not changed. This is the same as it's been for a few years. Uh, however, we must evaluate our RF exposure in our area of our antennas. I think we should have documentation available in case the FCC stops by or if somebody complains. And if we're out of compliance, we always have to correct that. So the current exposure standards uh, have not changed at all. And at Harmo uh, this report in order harmonizes the exposure rules across all these services. What you'll notice is now the biggest change is the categorical exclusion and the table are now gone. We now have to use a formula-based evaluation. The maximum permissible exposure limits have not changed. They're still the same. And we have an, event, an exemption as well. If a ham antenna is within 20 centimeters of our body, we need to do a field measure or a model of that signal. Mobile and portable and transmitters are, of course, included. Mobile radios, HDs. If you're going on a park on the air or a summit on the air, you have to uh, know what your field is as well. And uh, also repeaters. So you have to prove that your station is safe. And you can do that in any reasonable way. Newer change stations must be in compliance now. Uh, existing stations who complied before yesterday have until May 3rd, 2023 to come into uh, compliance. And that's just do your calculation, make sure you're clean and stick it in the drawer. Um, the ARRL is assisting the FCC all along the way and they're making new tools for us along this. And Ed Hare just recently updated the frequency, uh, frequently asked question sheet. And that's available on the ARRL RF exposure webpage. So this chart is gone. Uh, we can't go by this anymore. We have to do the calculation. However, they gave us something else. Uh, table two are exemptions based on frequency, power, and uh, location from the antenna. Uh, if you're below a certain threshold ERP, you're good to operate. And of course, if you're working with super QRP stuff under one milliwatt, don't even bother. Okay. So here's table two. And it's based on the basic formula of distance. It has to be greater or equal to wavelength over two pi. Uh, for us, we have two ranges that are mostly used, 1.34 megs to 30 megs and 30 to 30, 300 megahertz. And you use the threshold ERP calculation on the right. So we can't exceed our maximum exposure because it causes heat in the body. Uh, and we now know that this varies with frequency. This signal level is measured in milliwatts per square centimeter, and it's averaged over time, like I said, 30 minutes for uncontrolled and six minutes for us. There is no reset period, so you can't drop carrier or drop transmission and wait a moment and then start over again. Here is the old chart on OAT65. It shows us that the broad AM broadcast band is most sensitive. Then we get to the uh, HF band, uh, which uh, uh, gets less. VHF is most sensitive, rather. And then uh, getting up to UHF and microwaves, it calms down a little bit. Um, this is a general guide. And we'll determine that by calculation. So. Um, you don't have to submit the results to the FCC. 
But if you change your station, like you buy an amplifier or you install a new dipole antenna that's closer to you than it used to be, you have to redo the calculations. And of course, if you find a different way that you prefer, go ahead and do that. I recommend we document it just in case an event occurs like your neighbor complains. So BHF being uh, too sensitive, uh, most sensitive to uh, exposure. Uh, older HTs are grandfathered as of yesterday. New HTs, uh, when they start making them, they're going to have to have an SAR done on them. But if you go to ham radio outlet today or tomorrow, you can go buy what's on the shelf. Um, here is a uh, table for limits for occupational or uh, controlled environment. You'll see our averaging time is six minutes, and we have a pretty high power density uh, that we can deal with. For the general population, it's averaged over 30 minutes, and it's uh, more sensitive, uh, lower power density here. Some people decide to buy a NARDA meter. You don't have to. Not many people do. It's a good unit, but reflections and whatnot do affect the results of this, so you have to be careful how you use it. Uh, this is not something I recommend. On interesting antennas like loop antennas or magnetic loops or uh, NFED uh, uh, wire antennas, it's probably best that you go to EasyNEC and do a model of the antenna of interest to determine uh, what your signal level is with and without ground reflections. Professionals use SAR modeling, uh, primarily cell phones. It's very, very expensive uh, laboratory equipment and not recommended. They use other two other things that I just mentioned that you don't need to worry about. That is FDTD and FEM measurements. Um, OET65C, if you care, you can look up that a little bit more. Somebody asked me a question about feed line, whether it radiates, specifically ladder line, and if both coax and ladder line are perfectly matched from the source to the antenna, they will not radiate. Uh, ladder line has uh, two phases, uh, one phase on each leg, and they cancel each other, so you do not have to worry about uh, radiation from somebody being near your feed line. Uh, you just need to calculate the loss in the feed line to determine your power. So in OAT65, for many years, there have been equations that allow you to protect your safe field strength. Uh, and of course, it results in the result of power density. Um, it's a reasonable determination, and hopefully your station is below safe MPE. But today, uh, some inventive people have put some stuff online that's really fun to use. So you just put your values in there. Here's the equation. Power density is equal to power uh, times the gain of the antenna divided by four pi times the distance squared. Don't even bother to worry about this. They put it in a, in a spreadsheet and an online calculator. But what you do need to figure out is average power. This is based on mode. Uh, duty cycle of a transmitter and the time you're transmitting. Averaging time can have your exposure, uh, can really be a good thing on your doing your calculation. Uh, FT8 has a duty cycle of 50%, and most of the other modes are on the right. So basically, conversational sideband is 20% duty. If you're running a contest station with running your speech processor, you're at 40%. And a lot of digital modes in FM are generally 100% power. So here are just a few of the online RF exposure calculators you can use. Paul VP9KF on his hintlink.com website. This shows compliance at a given distance of your interest. The Lake Washington Hand Club with Wayne N6NB writing some of the code uh, shows distance to compliance. And then the Ham Radio School has an Excel spreadsheet that you can save on your computer and run it for various uh, bands and interests and save the results that way. That shows your MPE and compliance for a given distance. So they're just easy to use 
And the only things you have to be concerned about is your true ERP power and average power and whether they're using meters or feet as a distance. So let's run through three different sets of calculations. The first one will be a 10 meter home SSB station. Uh, guy got a 100 watt ICOM 7300. The second one is a 20 meter contest station running 1500 watts PEP. And the third is a two meter FM mobile running 50 watts to a roof antenna. So here's a 10 meter sideband home station. 100 watts PEP, we're gonna have to convert this to average power. Uh, a dipole generally has a unity gain of 2.2 dB above an isotropic radiator. And then 100 feet of RG58 coax has about 2 dB loss to get to the antenna, which is good for us for this calculation. So we figured out with the 2 dB loss and averaging our sideband power, the input into this calculator is 62.5 watts. And there's our dipole gain. And the distance from the area of interest is nine meters or 27 feet. And we're operating on 28.5 megahertz. And we decided to include the effects of ground reflections. So here are the results. At 28.5 megahertz, you're creating 0 0.0262 milliwatts per square centimeter at uh, 29 feet, okay? Your controlled environment is creating 1.1 milliwatts per square centimeter, and the uncontrolled environment is 0 0.23. And both of these are fully compliant, so it's easy to go. Now, we have to say, if you decide to go to 50 meters or 20, or 40, it gets better. People can get closer to your antenna. Okay, here's a big gun sideband contest station at 1500 watts. We convert that to average. We use a beam antenna, which has nine dB gain. And we're using 100 feet of RG8, which has just about a half dB of loss. And we're using a Lake Washington Club's calculator on this one. For them, we have to, uh, get our average power going. So 1500 watts times the loss of the coax times the duty cycle is 270 watts into 9 dB gain. The results, we're good. We're gonna be putting out a power density of 4.46 milliwatts per centimeter squared at six and a half feet, okay, for controlled people. For uncontrolled, they just need to be 14 feet away. So you're excellent, good to go. Two meter FM guy, guy in a car, two meter mag mount with a five eighths wave vertical. Transmit percentage is half time. So on FM, he's transmitting half the time and listening half the time. Five eighths wave vertical has 4.4 dBi gain. Uh, and then the coax loss is really minimal because it's just five feet. So here are the values. I played around with this and looked at the very bottom item, distance to area of interest. I played around with that number and I came up to 8.7 feet. And with 8.7 feet, we're in compliance for both um, the um, uh, controlled and uncontrolled people. And I can play around with this calculator later if we want, if we have time. So I really recommend you uh, run your own calculations, play with more than one calculator and put your numbers in and see what the results are. And when you feel comfortable that your results are reasonably accurate, print them out, keep the results and have a cold beer for the FCC inspector if they ever come by. If you're not compliant, there are a few things you can do here. Obviously, you restrict access to the antenna fencing. Uh, you can mount your antennas higher. You can talk for shorter periods. You can lower your power, or you can pause operating when, pe when people come by. If you need help, the ARRL, ARRL Technical Information Service is always available for you. You can email them at tis at And I want to plug Ed's book, 
from 1998. It's really an excellent thing. It has a number of articles. It talks about OAT65. It talks about how you can do your measurements. It talks about the basics of uh, uh, RF fields. And Ed can talk more about that. But at the end of the day, just note what your station is and calculate your fields, uh, your RF field MPEs for all the bands and modes you use using any online calculation or any other way. And if you're not in compliance, just do something about it to make it into compliance. Here's some web links. The main one is the RF exposure page that the AWRL is updating continuously. And if you want to read the FCC documents, you can go directly to them on the FCC's uh, websites. And then I use this COAX calculator at QSL.net, C-O-A-T-W's calculator, to determine feed line loss. And then there's a link to Ed Hare's book, which is free download as a PDF. And then I came across RIA, N2RJ's video on YouTube that is really worth watching. She goes through calculations. She, ex she explains uh, near field and far field and what you need to do. It's worth the time there. So lastly, I want to thank Ed here for helping us out and showing up here to answer some questions. Greg Lappin, N9GL, for his uh, long, long uh, effort in uh, radiation. Chris Bickell for um, running this uh, meeting here for us. And then Phil Temples, uh, New England Vice Director. And I definitely want to thank you for showing up and joining and listening to us. If you have questions, you can email me. But I think what we're going to do is head on over to uh, Ed here, W1RFI, and um, see if we can uh, have some questions and answers done. So I'm going to turn off my screen share. And um, uh, Dan, you may want to leave it on in case some questions refer to the slides. Sure, we can do that. Uh, we can go back and forth. So let's go to um, these questions here. And just select the ones you think might be the most interesting and uh, I'll I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, okay. Sure if I know it and if I don't know it, I'll make up something I think you're gonna believe. Well, I only have one question here is asking for uh, sending the links to a club to K1RAU. Are there, are there any other questions? I see about six of them, Dan. All right, here we go. Okay, I pulled it up. All right, let's go to the top of the list here. So Ed, uh, David says, I use a loop. How can I model it? Well, one of the ways to model the loop, especially if it's a larger loop, uh, what I would recommend is you go to uh, the EasyNEC program. Um, a free version, a demo version of EasyNEC is available on the easyneck.com webpage. Um, it's it's uh, fully functional. Its only limitation is it's limited in the number of segments, but it's more than enough to model a loop antenna, model a dipole, model a small Yagi, and uh, you can model that and either get the free space gain and add the ground reflection factor in one of the calculator pages, or you can model it over real ground at its real height and ask it to calculate the near fields for you, both the electric and mag magnetic fields, which you can then determine whether your station's in compliance. Okay, thank you, Ed, very, very much. Next question from Ethan. Can you clarify what you mean by existing HTs are grandfathered in? Does this mean we don't need to evaluate HTs we already own, even if they are two meters? Um, yeah, that's correct. FCC is pretty much indicated, although we're still waiting for some uh, more official clarification. But any HTs that are marketed prior to May 3rd of this year, um, are going to be basically grandfathered. In other words, if it's an older model HT that either you own or you go up and buy one that was never, not a brand new one, but had been marketed legally under the old rules, you can pretty much use that with confidence uh, that you know it's going to be uh, in compliance with the rules. New ones, the manufacturer is really going to need to do that specific absorption rate testing. Uh, there's no way that the average amateur would have the ability to test that. There are some anti uh, there are some models that can be used, but they too are very expensive. Uh, and so uh, ultimately that's gonna be a problem more for the manufacturers than the individual amateurs. 
So one, one added question here, Ed. I'm under the assumption that uh, I, if I purchase a HT tomorrow, I don't have to do anything about that. I just yeah, use well, it. Yeah, you certainly can't do specific absorption rate testing. And again, if you purchase one tomorrow that has been previously marketed, uh, you know, under the existing rules, uh, pretty much your only option is to go ahead and use it. Uh, ultimately, again, that's going to be a problem for the manufacturers. Uh, they do this now for commercial radios. Uh, our RF safety committee is looking at all of the commercial SAR testing because, of course, many of these models are available. They're certificated under, say, FCC Part 90. They're the same basic radios that we're using on amateur radio, uh, just reprogrammed to transmit on amateur channels. So we're looking at that, seeing that across a wide range of these, uh, all of these commercial models at power levels and basically immediately adjacent frequencies that we use have passed. And uh, we're ultimately finding ways the FCC will accept that data uh, for amateur radio. That's still determined. But in the meantime, if you're buying an existing radio marketed prior to May 3rd, uh, at that point, it's considered to be pretty much grandfathered. Okay, thank you so much. Next question from Chris. Uh, I think many stations don't have matched feed cabling to the antenna. In those situations, do coax or ladder line radiate? If so, what do you do about it? And actually, it's not necessarily a question of matching. It's a question of balance. Uh, for example, that open wire line can be operating at a rather high SWR, but if it's balanced at the source, balanced at the antenna, uh, for the most part, those are not going to be radiating. Uh, if you do have a problem with balance, uh, most of the time, you're going to get some RF in the shack. You're going to cut your transmitter chassis, even perhaps, I remember in my young days, I had some pretty uh, wild antenna systems. And uh, I would occasionally get little RF burns by touching my microphone or my transmitter chassis. So that's clearly an indication you have some feed line radiation. But if you have a piece of coax, you're, you're coming out the unbalanced uh, uh, connection on your transmitter, your transmitter is well grounded, it's going up to an antenna uh, that is not uh, significantly unbalanced, uh, then that's going to be not radiating from the feed line for the most part. Uh, it's right. the kind of, you know, you do the best you can with designing that station, because remember, we're not required to measure our stations, we're not required to calculate our stations, we are required to evaluate our stations. And so if you're going to evaluate that station and say, look, my feed line is, is well balanced, it's well designed, uh, I don't have 18 clip leads holding it to my transmitter, then uh, you know you can pretty much say I've evaluated my feed line, it's right, I believe now I can use these calculations to accurately determine uh, what my station is doing. Okay, and it just, it just reminds me of my novice days, you know, I was running a Heathkit Apache and I was getting RF burns on my Morse code key. So, well, yeah, and that uh, indicates that look that indicates something is wrong with your station. And I can guarantee you, if you're getting RF burns when you touch your Morse code key, uh, your feed line is giving you problems. That's something you want to correct. That will be above the limits. I would not feel comfortable evaluating my station as safe if I had those kind of problems. Right. Exactly. That's you know uh, one of the things I'm noting is that we took chances in younger days. And now we have to be a little bit more safe. So anyway. I, I did it driving too, but we're not going to go into those stories. <laughs> All right. So uh, Fred and Ant Antonio uh, basically asking to download the slides or the links. Yeah, we're going to have the links and the slides and the video available uh, after this. Uh, may not be tonight, maybe tomorrow, but you'll be able to see the results of this presentation tonight. Um, Fred uh, noted here, Dan said, don't bother with the feed line because it doesn't radiate. The problem is with NFED type antennas, the feed line is part of the antenna and it can radiate a lot. Well, uh, maybe, um, probably not. I mean, if you're feeding that NFED antenna with coax, the signal is staying in it. If it's well grounded at some point where that goes you know, external to your shack, uh, there's no real reason that the feed line should radiate. Now, if you're running that feed line directly to your transmitter output, uh, I'm running that antenna directly to your transmitter output, there is no feed line. That vertical piece of wire that might go off to your, your 
horizontal piece is very much a part of your antenna. You need to consider that when you say the calculators show I need to be 18 feet from any part of my antenna, that's your antenna. But if you're running a piece of coax out the window, grounded, connected to that same antenna, you only need to really consider the antenna unless you have some sort of imbalance or other problem that's causing you uh, identifiable problems. Very good, thank that's you so well much. That's all grounded and connected to the antenna. There really shouldn't be any problems. Okay, thank you. Next question, is the distance from the antenna measured perpendicular to the antenna? How does one address when a person is above or below the antenna? Well, when you when you plunk in into that uh, program your antenna gain, that's in the main lobe of the antenna. That could be horizontal, it could be vertical. Uh, and so when you plunk in that gain, that says the maximum possible signal from this antenna is in the main lobe. Um, and so um, that would account for above, below, adjacent to, uh, anything, because that is a worst case calculation. Um, if you were to find, for example, that uh, you, you model the antenna and you have that Yagi that's actually radiating slightly upward, uh, they are putting down less energy in the ground, you say, oh my goodness, I didn't pass. If you were to go ahead and model that antenna using EasyNet, you could calculate the near field electric and magnetic field strength along the ground and find, oh, it's much lower than that worst case estimate. And so I just passed. In fact, in the RF exposure in your book, we did exactly that. We modeled a number of antennas at various heights above ground. We calculated ground level exposure, first story exposure, and second story exposure horizontally from that antenna and found out beyond a certain distance you were in compliance, that can be used to evaluate your station uh, as well. You know, what I also suggest with a calculator is the easiest way to do this is, you, uh, it's wonderful that you talked all about the average power and feed line loss, but what I like to do is put in my, my transmitter output power and PEP, assume no feed line loss, assume 100%, most of the time you pass, you now do not need to do all of that, and anything you do going forward uh, is, is going to uh, certainly comply because you complied with full power and absolute worst case. Now, the other question was about how do you calculate distance from the antenna? We call that the slant range distance or the diagonal distance between any part of that antenna and any areas where humans might be exposed. Now, uh, as, as Dan had said very accurately, you can control that by keeping people out of any areas that are not in compliance. Uh, if, for example, and I'll take an extreme case, uh, you found out that, well, in my neighbor's house, I've exceeded the limits. If you know the guy's not home, you can actually transmit because there's no human actually being exposed. I don't recommend it. You don't know whether he has a guest in the house, but you know that basic principle might be worth considering. Uh, others who might say, well, in my mobile installation, it says I need to be eight feet and I'm only four feet from the antenna, but you know, I only transmit for 10 seconds saying W1RFI listening, no one comes back to me and I'm done. Well, in that six minute averaging, your average power is well below your transmit power. And so by taking that worst case estimate uh, and you pass, at that point, it's the simplest evaluation. The dreaded evaluation is over. Very good, excellent, excellent answer. Um, and this goes into the same line here. Are the calculations pretty much in line with the old tables or are they more or less restrictive, Chris asks. Well, they're, they're actually the same. Um, you know, on, under the old tables, remember the table in the rules that was changed was an exemption table saying, for example, if you're running less than 500 watts on 80 meters, you do not need to do a calculation or an evaluation of your station. Uh, the, old, the old evaluations use the same web pages we're using now, use the same FCC material we're using now. Now, FCC may ultimately revise some of that material, but if you're required to do an evaluation now, you go to the FCC website, you use the material they have, they certainly are going to agree that you had done the required evaluation of your station. Good, thank you. Uh, Tom has a lazy H antenna. Does he have to model it in EasyNEC? 
Um, I think I would, and there, there's two ways you can model that on easy neck is, is go ahead and model it. Uh, I've had a few amateurs contact me because they know I'm pretty good at modeling. Uh, we can even get one of the lab guys to, to run some of that if, if you can give us some of the dimensions of the antenna. It really doesn't take too long most of the time. And if we model that and get the gain of that antenna, and if you happen to know the gain of the antenna, you can simply use it, use that in the calculator. If you end up passing, uh, you know, you're done. If not, we can take a look at, well, what is that exposure on at ground level? And say your neighbor has a one-story home, you know, at 10 feet above the ground. And uh, we could then, if need be, take the actual antenna. I know in the RF exposure and U-book, we did not model the lazy age. But, you know, we're willing to help amateurs do it. In fact, I remember I went off to one of the conventions when these rules were first instituted uh, 25 years ago when amateur radio... Uh, some amateurs needed to uh, evaluate their station. I would sit at the convention and my challenge was three minutes or less and your evaluation can be over. And so I, I would run easy neck and go ticket a ticket a ticket or, or run the calculators. And, and sure enough, uh, I don't think I ever, I ever lost the bet. Ah, excellent, excellent. And- uh, well, If people need help, really call us. We're willing to help yeah. you if you're really- Oh, he's, questions he's, that, that weren't answered here, uh, feel free to contact me. Indeed. Okay. Andy, uh, Andy uh, uh, KB1OIQ is uh, asking about software that uh, for this stuff. We're using websites that are using online calculators, and then uh, one of them is an Excel spreadsheet that you can run in Windows or uh, Macintosh or Linux and whatnot. So you're good to go on all computing platforms here. Um, yeah, and that's so, one of the reasons I like the web page calculators because they're not dependent on operating systems. They're not dependent on what uh, software you might have running on your machine. I know Wayne Overbeck had, had produced a lot of this initial work in, in BASIC, and I think his claim was, well, this will run on most forms of BASIC. Uh, we don't want that. We want to have something you go to the web, the calculation is done on their server and, and given back to you in numbers you can use. And I think the most useful part of those calculators is when you put in your power uh, and, and any losses if you need to, it tells you the distance that people need to be from your antenna. And if people are going to always be at greater distance, I mean, it comes up and says 20 feet and your antenna is 50 feet in the air, you're done. Uh, at that point, no one could possibly be exposed over the limits to that antenna unless your neighbor were to go up in a hot air balloon and remain there for 30 minutes while you transmit a carrier. Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So uh, Scott notes, considering your two meter analysis, it stated that people need to be eight feet away. Does this include the operator? Uh, very few vehicles have that separation from antenna to operator, or is this primarily for bystanders? Well, it's actually for both. I mean, the, under the FCC rules, we are required to ensure that we are not exposing ourselves, but because the limits for that operator are controlled, they are higher than the limits for the general public. And the principle is that you as an operator have knowledge of RF, have knowledge of the implications of RF, you have access to a national organization that can help you with these things. So they're permitting you because you are in control of this and can recognize problems a higher exposure level than they will to the general public. And so you might well find that when you run in average power on that transmission, and the, uh, the fact that the controlled exposure permits closer exposure at, at a greater level, uh, that more, more likely the, uh, the mobile station will comply, especially when you consider how you use mobile. I mean, how many amateurs are driving down the road with the key, uh, the push to talk, pressed and talking for six minutes? Well, virtually none. And so if you find that, well, I didn't quite pass, it says I need to be four feet and it's only three feet away, you're going to reduce your average power basically by reducing the amount of time you're going to transmit in a six minute window. Now I'll say this is inside of cars, uh, the exposure is almost always going to be much less than those uh, uh, predictions from the calculators would give you because you've got shielding by the car body, but we don't know what that is. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, we can look at some of the, the models and some of the other things and maybe come up with better answers. But for right now, unless you were to make actual measurements, 
in that mobile installation, I think if you use the calculator and the amount of time you actually transmit in a, in a six minute period. The other one I'll point out is you may evaluate yourself to uncontrolled exposure where you have a longer period of time. So if you say, well, I'm gonna transmit for six minutes and then stop for the remaining 30 minutes, you might find that the uncontrolled exposure passes where the controlled exposure doesn't, surprisingly. Very, very interesting. Good. Right, so, Thank no, you. you want to try it both ways, and you can comply mm -hmm. for you and the members of your household if you have given them some instructions on RF. They're aware that RF is being used and might recognize the symptoms. You know, and you talked earlier, Dan, about heating. I'll point out that the controlled exposure is probably equivalent to putting on a light sweater in terms of additional heat. Okay. Now, if it's 120 degrees out there, putting on a light sweater might not be a good idea, but that's why the FCC allows us a higher limit because we're aware of those factors and can take steps to control them when needed. Very good. Okay. Bob Dunn asks, from a practical real-world perspective, in what situations would someone actually exceed RF exposure rules? Oh, I can imagine a number of them. I mean, if you're a 1500 watt uh, station operator um, and, and even running CW where you have roughly a 40% duty factor uh, and you have an antenna located in the same room you are sitting or an antenna located on an apartment balcony and someone is immediately on the balcony next to you, I can well imagine that exceeding the limits under some worst case conditions. Now, if you found out that that antenna balcony antenna um, exceeded the limits to your neighbor's balcony, but you were able to control and know when the neighbor was or was not present, uh, you might be able to operate the station, even if some areas that could be accessible are not, but you really have an obligation to be absolutely certain of that. Um, you know, other ones, if you have that end-fed wire coming into your window, connected up directly to your transmitter, and you want to run high power, you know, where it said eight feet, and that's four feet from your head at, at full power, no, you would be exceeding the limits to yourself and possibly others under the same circumstances. Imagine the backyard vertical in an area, in a common area uh, in a condo, and people go up and put their lawn chairs around your antenna because it's warmer. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you know, I know. Yeah, there, there certainly are conditions where you might exceed the limits, and this is why the FCC expects us to do these evaluations. And 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 I just want to comment that many of us have built and tested a 10-meter dipole in our shack. So. Well, yeah, but if you do it briefly, uh, you're probably not going to exceed the limits. I'm going to transmit right. for 30 seconds and look at my SWR meter before I put that up in the air. Uh, at that point, you're you're going to be pretty much below the limits. Uh, All right. And, um, if not, you know, you need to control your own exposure by limiting the amount of time you transmit. Okay. Now, I will point out, too, the other one is we found even on 80 meters where the limits are pretty high, you're going to exceed the limits if you wrap four turns of wire around your head instead of three. <laughs> All right. Do we have to document uh, temporary antennas uh, such as uh, field day, James asks? Well, you don't have to document anything. Um, you know, the... The FCC rules simply require you to evaluate your station unless you are otherwise categorically exempt on the basis of their formulas. It's much like the stop sign rules. We have a requirement to stop at a stop sign. We do not fill out a form and send it to the police department or keep a log that says every time we stop. So there's no actual mandate to document your station. I consider it a good idea. Because if your neighbor comes along and says, hey, what are you doing over there with all those antennas? And that subject comes up and with all the uh, uh, concern about 5G and some of the uh, hyperbole that I've seen out there, this could happen. Uh, being able to demonstrate to a neighbor that you have complied with the FCC rules for safety is a good idea. And of course, in the rather unlikely but possible event that the FCC contacts you about your evaluation, it's handy to just be able to pull it out rather than having to redo it, which you could actually do. So for yeah. a temporary antenna, no, you don't have to document it. Might not be a bad idea. You've done your, your calculation. Doing a quick print screen and dumping it off to your printer might be, might be easy enough. But say you put it up on the fly out there and somebody gets online and, and you do a quick evaluation, there is no mandate to keep records, just a recommendation um, for, for, for obvious reasons. Yeah, and I tend to think that this, this FCC change is going to allow us to 
do these numbers as a kind of a semi-regular thing and become more cognizant of what our RF fields are. Uh, well, so that my, the, yeah, go ahead. Well, that was the intent of the rules 25 years ago. Um, you know, prior to that, when we had higher limits, uh, amateur radio was completely exempt with the presumption that they would always comply. Uh, when the limits were reduced some some 25 years ago, they said, well, some amateurs need to evaluate their stations. All right. uh, uh, as far as an ongoing basis, once you do an evaluation of a particular setup, uh, if you say go from one 100 watt transmitter to another 100 watt transmitter, you don't need to redo it. Uh, you don't need to recalculate every two years. If you have previously done an evaluation, or uh, then you don't even after two years from now, you don't need to redo it. What you did is fine if you haven't made any changes to your station. Okay, thank you. John asks, uh, can you go over the two meter uh, power at 50 watts again? If your duty cycle is low, say at 20%, does that lower the average power or not? No, absolutely. I mean, if you were running, say, 50 watts on two meters, and I'm just going to ignore feed line losses, and we'll just say you're running it off to a, 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 an isotropic antenna even, uh, you, you're going to find that you have a certain level of exposure. Well, if you're doing this on FM, the, the mode duty factor is 100%. But if you're only transmitting for one minute out of 30 minutes, uh, you get on that local repeater and you put your call sign out there once in a while, then your average power is 1 30th of that 50 watts. You can put that into the calculator and be very, very pleased with, with the, uh, the required distance. Now, keep in mind, you have to say, what is the most I will ever do? So if you say, you know, I might go key down for 30 minutes on FM, then you would need to do that 100% calculation at 50 watts because someone might be exposed even that one time. It's not what you usually do. It's what you might do if people are present in areas where exposure is possible. Okay. Uh, George asks, if I want to use an alternative antenna on a newly purchased HT, do I need to check that it's properly qualified with that particular HT? Well, right now, there is no way to check that. And, and what I'm going to suggest is as follows, is if an amateur needs to evaluate their station, there's, the FCC expects us to do so. The FCC has prepared material that it's probably revising. Uh, we're working closely with them. But if you have a, a requirement to evaluate your station and you go to the FCC site and you download OET Bulletin 65 Supplement B and do what it says, that's the best you can do right now with the FCC's own material. I mean, ultimately, yes, if you start putting uh, different antennas on that radio, if that radio had SAR testing done with a really poor antenna and you put a really good antenna, uh, then possibly uh, you could be changing the, the, the absorption to your body. But look at it this way. If I have an HT with a little antenna about the size of my head, all of that energy, even if it's inefficient, is coming into my body. If I replace that with a whip, a lot of that emission is happening up above. Even though that whip is better, it might have much less exposure to me because parts of that antenna are farther away. Worst case analysis, I need to say, what's the closest distance to the antenna in practice? Those are questions I think that ultimately we're going to answer. Okay. Uh, Dan asks, I use an ATAS-120 on a tripod in my HOA. Do I treat that as a quarter wave vertical? Um, I certainly would. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's approximately the same size. It's going to have the same basic uh, emissions. And if you were to take and run that in free space, uh, I think if I'm remembering correctly, it's about 1.2 dBi of gain. And then include the ground reflection factor in the calculator, you would come very close to what that antenna would do. As a vertical, although ground losses will slightly tip it up, uh, when you're up close to that antenna, you're really in the main lobe of the antenna. So if I were evaluating my station, I would use that 1.2 dBi gain uh, and, and include the ground reflection factor and recognize that I need to keep people at least that far away uh, if they're going to spend any real time in the presence of the antenna. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike asks, what about photo activations? Do you need to drag a laptop with easy neck and a tape measure to model your setup? 
Well, uh, uh, you want the, the, the practical answer or the real answer? I mean, if I were going out and doing a POTA and I had previously calculated, well, you know, if I'm going to run that antenna in the trees, uh, I can certainly take a look and see if there's anybody in the park immediately next to me. And I know that people need to be from that antenna, the long wire I'm putting up there, I'm going to run a ground rod or even connect it to the body of my car. Um, I think once you have done that calculation in one set of circumstances, unless those other circumstances are dramatically different, if I were evaluating my station, I would have said I've evaluated the antenna based on its free space gain. I've included a ground reflection factor. Uh, it's not going to be much different from one park to the other. I'm going to remain the same distance from the antenna. I'm going to keep people out of the immediate field of the antenna. Uh, and I'd feel pretty comfortable myself doing that one time. Okay, uh, let's see. There is one kind of interesting question here. Chris asks, have these questions been validated and verified? Uh, he does modeling work and he wants to know whether these are uh, really solid calculations. Well, I mean, the calculations on these um, RF exposure calculators are based upon free space conditions with a ground reflection factor of four dB. Uh, and, and, you know, some people have said, well, a vertical antenna uh, doesn't have a ground gain. Well, actually, it does to some extent, although it also has ground losses. But I'm suggesting that we add the 4 dB anyway, because that also accounts from other reflections that may be around you. I mean, if you think about this, if you model an antenna over ground, you've modeled the antenna over ground, but you have not modeled all of the possible reflectors near you, some of which you can't know where they are. You have in your own house electrical wiring, you have telephone wiring, you have DSL wiring, you have coaxial cable running around, you have overhead power lines. All of these things near your antenna are actually scatterers that would be almost impossible to model. Uh, and so what you're going to do with these models is, is use the best assumptions you can make because, again, you are required to evaluate your station. And I think, honestly, if I did my station and found I was within a couple tenths of a dB of compliance, I might want to take a closer look at exposure and what I'm doing with that station because I know other factors could actually make me slightly above the limits. Um, and so the, the modeling for EasyNEC is well known and accepted if you have the perfect model. I mean, I'll think of the W1AW antenna system. We can model an antenna, but that's not correct. We have one antenna at W1AW, whatever antenna we happen to be feeding and all the other ones around it that are even to some extent parasitic elements on the driven element of the antenna we're feeding. Um, you know, modeling is a really good approximation. Uh, but a model can only be as good as the input, and there are things you cannot know. Do you know exactly where the electrical wiring in your wall is? Probably not. You know you have some. And, and the commission has historically accepted these models as being a reasonable, bona fide effort to actually evaluate the station. Uh, and, and the only thing that could ever prove that model wrong would be actual measurements. Should that happen, you would be expected to correct them. If not, you have done what the rules require, which is to reasonably evaluate your station. And I, you know, I see that, uh, I feel that the FCC has made these calculations rather conservatively from a human standpoint, uh, a heating standpoint. So uh, the other thing I see, I, I'm playing with these calculators. I've done the ground, I've unchecked the ground reflection boxes and saw what it did for my uh, uh, field strength as well. Uh, which is very interesting. Uh, Jay has a question about a vertical on the roof. What about the energy coming in the house from that vertical? Uh, yes, uh, that's entirely possible. When you put the vertical on the roof and you have radials, those are not ground. Those are an active radiating part of your antenna. And so if you yeah. have that vertical on the roof, when you say, okay, I know the vertical, I'm going to assume that 1.2 dBi gain, uh, and, and that would probably be pretty reasonable, but it says you need to be, you as, as the operator for controlled exposure, need to be, say, eight feet from the antenna. You need to be eight feet from those vertical, uh, the, 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 the ground plane uh, radials on that antenna because they are actually radiating energy. Uh, they're coupling some into the ground, and the, the closer you get to the ground, the less that's a factor. Now, if I really needed a more precise answer, I would model that antenna at, say, six feet above ground and say, if I'm walking underneath it, 
what is my exposure? If my neighbor's over here in his yard, 20 feet from the, the antenna, what's his exposure? It'll vary from the antenna at this height than it will from the antenna at this height. And so to get that answer, really, that's one of those examples where running the easy neck model is probably a good one. The good news is the free program will do that for you. Good. Uh, Larry, KD8MZM has a funny comment here. He says he's an old Navy missile radar tech. To prove RF was hazardous whenever anyone questioned him, why restrict access to the destroyer fan tail during calibration, they'd get a steak from the galley, put it on the cal target, and cook it. Never have to do it twice. Uh, I bet. And, and you know, it, it's funny as... Uh... You know, there's no doubt that at high levels, RF is dangerous. I mean, the example he cited, inside your microwave oven, there's about 500 watts of power all contained in that little cube. Uh, very, very little gets out. But inside that, there's no doubt that exposure at those levels would be exceptionally dangerous to human beings. Uh, in fact, right. it's kind of interesting is when they did these studies, uh, they literally built these standards from tens of thousands of studies that were done. And what they found is that in a specific absorption rate, and I think it's at four watts per kilogram of body mass, they started to see unwanted biological effects. That's roughly equivalent to locking yourself into a closet with a 500 watt heater. Uh, you realize that pretty soon you'd be overheated, perhaps to the point of it being dangerous. Uh, they then said, well, you know, we don't fully understand these factors, so let's build in some safety factors. So they built in a safety factor of 50 for the general public level of exposure, a safety factor of 10 for the occupational or controlled level of exposure. Now, I, I, I say this in a funny way, but it's some element of truth to it. So they would teach the monkey to push a banana six times and you get a banana, they'd put him in the field, he'd, he'd get overheated or whatever else might be going on, he'd get lethargic, not want the banana at all, they would remove the field, he'd decide he's hungry after all, push the button and eat his banana. So they literally set the levels of exposure at 2% of the level that made a monkey not want to eat a banana. <laughs> and, and, and I, well, it's 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 an anecdotal story, but I think it communicates the point that you know, uh, you know, on these levels, you really are safe. It's like heat. We have a certain temperature range in which we're safe. We might be a little uncomfortable at 60 degrees. We might be a little uncomfortable at 85 degrees, but we're generally safe within that temperature range. Same thing with RF. Below this level you are safe. It's not that you're more safe. It's not like ionizing radiation where any amount contributes to some danger. Uh, these are mostly thermal effects, although the standard is not limited to that. And so um, it, it's generally a pretty safe level of exposure at 2% of the level. Okay, you got it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's do the last question from Charlie, WD5BJT. I'm running 500 watts on 50 megahertz. The beam antenna main lobe goes through the house. Should I be concerned? How high is the antenna is the first question to ask because what we found when we did the, uh, the modeling of EasyNEC, using EasyNEC uh, over ground, is I did not find a single instance of an antenna at a height of 60 feet or greater that caused any exposure above the limits, even with full carrier at six feet above ground, 10 feet above ground, or 20 feet above ground. In other words, my neighbor's two-story home. Uh, and, and so uh, if that main, main beam goes through the house, how high is it? Uh, how much, uh, what is your duty factor? What is your average power? How far away is it? I mean, if you say, well, it's 200 feet in the backyard, you're gonna be fine. I just know that from experience, although it's probably a good idea to actually run the numbers and do the calculation. So um, that's probably, a, a, did you have more questions or was that just the last one? Uh, no, that's about the last one. I want to thank you very much, Ed, for answering all these very, very good questions. I also want to state that, yeah, we will have the recording available as well as the slide deck and the links and uh, these these important PDF documents, the FCC OAT uh, 65, the B, uh, the new report and order, and uh, we'll have a link to Ed Hare's book as well available. Um, if you don't get it in a couple of days, you can email me, w1dan at awrl.net. Good, and Ed, what I want to point you. to, uh, before we Please. do an important point about the book, now the book was yeah. done, I think in 1998. 
And so all of the information about categorical exemptions and who's exempt from evaluating, it's changed now. So, you know, there's a table in there that says if you're using less than 500 watts on 80 meters, gone, you'll need to use the newer methods that are linked in the FAQ. Uh, but all of the information about how to evaluate a station, there are pages upon pages upon pages of the results of antenna modeling of different antennas at different heights. That's perfectly valid, completely uh, no change the FCC will make uh, in the foreseeable future should change that. So uh, other than the categorical exemption for amateur radio, that material in that book, and right now even a few of the articles we have on our RF exposure page is not current, it's not completely valid, but all the information about how to evaluate is. And the last thing I'll say I will remind is if you had a question that was not answered, uh, or you didn't want to type it out and hear it right over this thing, TIS, Tango Italy Sierra, at ARRL.org, and we'll get one of the lab guys to, to give you a, a, an answer, even perhaps to help you out uh, with an evaluation. If you do want to talk to us on the phone, include a phone number and a time to call, and we'll try to get back to you during that time frame, typically during normal business hours of 9 to 4 Eastern Daylight Time. Ed, thank you so, so much. It's been great. Well, it's been a pleasure too. So it, it's, it's, it's fun to stay here and talk yeah. from the lab at, at this hour of the night. So I'll say thank you all for attending. In fact, uh, Chris, if you're still, oh, Chris told me he left. Uh, do either of you guys have a, a running count of how many we have now? Uh, we're at 100% and uh, uh, I, I see 108 people. Oh, that's 108. Fine. Okay, very good. So we didn't lose too it many. Well, yeah. what I usually do when I'm in person is I, I tell them they can fall asleep, but if I'm doing a good job, I want them to fall asleep with their head tipped forward. Uh, that well, way you both did a great job. Uh, good. Well, yeah, everybody was wide awake, I'm sure. So uh, yeah. I thank you guys for doing this. This is great. Excellent right. presentation, Dan. Uh, and, and I'm glad to be here for the q and I think some of these, uh, I've just had so much experience. I've been doing this for the last 25 years. So, um, you know, uh, most of the time, I didn't even have to make up any answers. That's great. It's 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 really uh, uh, and you didn't have to open up your book either, right? Um, oh no, I haven't memorized. <laughs> Actually, that's so. What is oh. what does W one RFI stand for now? Well, that's really fine individual. And, and when I post on some of those internet news groups, I've been told it's real flaming idiot, but I'm not sure I. <laughs> Okay, Ed, thank you so much. Phil, thank you so much. And uh, you uh, at home, thank you very, very much for dialing in to us. Really appreciate it. Uh, send us your questions and we'll get through this very easily. We'll say 73 for now. And uh, thanks for dialing in. Bye bye. But, and the last point is a lot of people who listen to this, their evaluation might be over just on the basis of what they heard. <laughs> right, exactly. Okay, good night, exactly. all.